So thank you all. A tip of the hat to all of you for waking up early in the morning. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, a wag of the finger for sleeping in. I'm Michelle Romito, and I'm going to be talking about a project that I uh, both just finished and I'm just starting in Mexico, having to do with budding speciation in a clade of neotropical salamanders. Can you hear me without the mic? Yeah? Cool. All right. First off, I just want to thank all of my collaborators, Gabriela Parra from uh, Mexico, Carlos Vasquez Almasan from Guatemala, David B. Wake from the University of California, and Javier Sunier in Nicaragua. So the process I'm talking about today, budding speciation, is a form of allopatric speciation that occurs when a small population buds off from a more widespread species. And when this occurs on the periphery of the widespread species, we call it peripatric speciation. But it can also occur within the range of the more widespread species. And it often results in the colonization of a new niche, as in the case of these uh, Clarkia and Mimulus in California. And it's also been shown to play a role in uh, Drosophila on oceanic islands. I study neotropical salamanders, a group in which speciation is thought to be primarily allopatric and vicariant. Although Kozak and Weens in 2007 showed that uh, parapatric speciation along climatic gradients may also play a role. The problem is that although there are many species, a lot of them show really deep phylogeographic structure between populations and yet look the same. So in many cases, things are millions of years different and you can't tell them apart. An example of this is the subgenus Nanotriton, which has four species, maybe five. They show tens of millions of years of divergence. And some talks I try to convince you that these species are very different. Today I will not do that. So I've got teeth, some of them don't, but they basically all look the same, right? They're little brown salamanders. And yet, at a broader scale, the neotropical salamanders are really diverse. There are ones that live in caves. There are ones that are the smallest tailed vertebrates on the planet. There are ones that are the largest plethodontid salamanders. There are ones that jump around and live in trees. So we have very little morphological divergence in many clades over relatively long time scales, and yet we have a buildup of what looks like a lot of adaptive diversity. So we need to find a group in which we can study phenotypic change over a time scale when we can actually tie it into speciation. And I think we found it in the subgenus Polytoglossa of the genus Polytoglossa, which is the largest genus of neotropical salamanders. This genus has 13 species that occur from Mexico to Costa Rica. Uh, I'm just going to show four of them here, only once in the talk. There they are. They're lovely. You can forget about them. There are two widespread species in nuclear Central America, Polytoglossa mexicana, which occurs here from Chiapas all the way down to northern Nicaragua, and Polytoglossa striatula, which lives in the lowlands of Nicaragua, Honduras, and Costa Rica. The interesting thing about this subgenus is there are also a large number of narrowly endemic to microendemic species. And these tend to occur on the ranges, the edge of the ranges of more widespread species like Mulleri and O'Donnelli on the edge of Mexicana. Even more interestingly, though, if we look at the Nicaraguan volcanic cordillera, we have, uh, you may have seen this in the cyclotalks, there are a number of young volcanoes stretching here from central Nicaragua all the way down to the middle of Lake Nicaragua. We have Bolitoglossa striatula in the lowlands on the east side of the lake. And on each of the volcanoes here, on Volcan Mombacha, we have Bolitoglossa mombachuensis, and on Volcan Maderas in the middle of the lake, we have Bolitoglossa insularis. These are endemic to just a tiny part of the cloud forest on the top of each of the volcanoes. And just to show you what this looks like, this is approaching Volcan Maderas from a ferry across Lake Nicaragua. And here is the entire range of Bolitoglossa insularis. That's the only place it lives. And so there's some process which is producing these really narrowly endemic species, presumably from these widespread parental species. And so this looked like we might have a case of peripatric or budding speciation. And so the questions in the project are, does budding speciation produce these narrow and microendemic species? In which case we would see them nested phylogenetically within the widespread species. And furthermore, if budding speciation is associated with the colonization of a new niche, then we would also expect to see uh, climatic or ecological divergence between the narrowly endemic and the widespread species. And so using the finest technology that 2005 had to provide, we generated a five locus data set, including one mitochondrial and four nuclear loci, 
Uh, we made a species tree using Starbeast and did some standard phylogenetic analyses on a, a data set with wider population sampling for mitochondrial DNA. And so for the mitochondrial results, you don't have to worry too much about the tree, but the main message is that within each of these widespread species, which has a box around it, there is one of the narrowly endemic species. So Odonali within a lineage of Mexicana, Mulleri within another lineage of Mexicana, and Insularis and Mombachuensis within Striatula. And there is almost zero divergence in our fastest evolving markers between these narrowly endemic species and the widespread species. And the species tree results from Starbeast essentially back this up. So we have Polyglosa odama, or excuse me, we have two lineage of, of Mexicana, which are not sister species. We have Bolitoglosa mulleri as the sister species to one lineage of Bolitoglosa mexicana. And note the difference in color pattern. These do not look the same. Bolitoglosa odonali as sister to the other lineage of mexicana. Again, not the same. And perhaps more interestingly, both uh, Insularis and Bolitoglosa mombachuensis are extremely closely related to the widespread Bolitoglosa striatula. And it may not be obvious that these differ in color pattern, but Bolitoglosa striatula has a unique striatulated pattern, which is thought to be an adaptation to living in areas that have grass on them. These two live in cloud forests, they don't have that color pattern. And what I like about this is it sets up a number of comparisons that we can do between uh, species that presumably arose via budding speciation and their widespread sister taxa, and then sister species pairs that perhaps arose via a more traditional vicarian allopatric process. And in order to try to see if there's any ecological divergence between these species pairs, we use the method of Kozak and Weems in 2007, where you basically figure out the average minimum and maximum temperatures that a species uh, is subject to using the world plum data set. We built up a database of all the localities and figured out the hottest and the coldest it gets. You then look at the temperature overlap between two sister species over the course of a month and add it up over the course of the year. So these overlap values range from 0 to 12, 0 being no overlap ever and 12 being complete overlap over the entire course of the year. And in order to increase our sample size, we also used three species pairs from the sister subgenera. And although our sample size is quite small, uh, sister species that presumably arose via vicarian allopatric speciation tend to show really high values of climatic overlap, whereas at least some of the sister species pairs that we think arose via budding speciation have much lower overlap values. In particular, the ones down here are the, the microendemic species in Nicaragua that have moved into the cloud forest from the lowland rainforest. And so I think at least at the broad scale, both of the predictions of budding speci speciation were met in this group. So the narrowly endemic and microendemic species are in fact phylogenetically nested within and very closely related to the widespread species. And at least some of them show quite a bit of climatic niche divergence. And I think we've taken this about as far as we can with uh, traditional sequencing. So what I'm doing in my lab right now is we're generating um, transcriptome data to try to test some demographic models of for instance, recent population bottlenecks associated with the founding of each one of these species. And some preliminary data that we have show that uh, with an exon capture experiment, the results of 1,000 nuclear markers basically back up what we see from mitochondrial DNA in our four nuclear loci. And I'm really excited about this because I think that it gives us the opportunity to actually look for loci that might be involved in the adaptive divergence of these because we have really, really recent divergence of things that look quite different and live in different places. So we would expect a pretty homogeneous background for neutral genetic markers. And we might actually be able to pick out loci that cause, for example, the major difference in color between Bolivoglosa odonali and Bolivoglosa mexicana, or perhaps look for genes involved in thermal adaptation associated with moving into the cloud forest. And the fact that it seems to have occurred in parallel on each of the volcanoes in Nicaragua it sets up an even better natural experiment. Now I think the major question with this remains, are we just looking at some kind of ephemeral speciation phenomenon where these species blink in and out on the periphery of the widespread species? Or are we actually looking at the beginning of what turns little brown salamanders 
into the enormous ecomorphological diversity that we see at a very broad phylogenetic scale in these salamanders. So uh, if you're interested in working on any of the projects, either as a student or a postdoc, or you just want to work in the shiniest building in central Mexico, <laughs> yeah, of course. And I'd like to thank uh, the National Science Foundation, UC Mexis, and the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology for funding, as well as uh, the permitting agencies and some people who generously donated tissues to the project. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks.